Hi guys, Steve Dempster back at you again, Dempster Guitar Studio, with the second installment of this little um, mini-series, I guess, on strumming. So if you recall, in the first uh, video, I posed a question. Well, what I did is I played a strum pattern, and I asked you to watch the behavior of the strumming hand and choose between two different ways, which you felt was the correct ways. And if you recall, you know, for example, you could just close your eyes listening to both of those and for the most part you would determine that they both sound the same. They are identical in rhythm. There are some sonic differences because of the way my hand is moving over low strings and high strings that if your ears really tuned into that you might be going, no Steve, they sound totally different to each other. At that level you'd be correct. But simply at the level of the strumming or the, the rhythmic quality of it, you know, the da 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 that thing, they're identical. And my question was very simple. In comes an email. <clears throat> and my question was very simple. In terms of the basic training that people need to understand what's going on in strumming world, uh, one of the biggest problems that keeps coming up that I see in my studio uh, is that quite naturally students will hit strings uh, simply repeating or replicating what they hear. So if they hear a certain strumming pattern, as long as they get the da 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 uh, as long as they get that going, they're happy. So, you know, if they did nothing but downstrokes, that is one approach. You could do this, couldn't you? In fact, in, the sen in that sense, all four of the strums that I did are identical in rhythm. But really only one of them is correct from the point of view of getting really good training that allows you to interpret a wider variety of strum patterns and this is the key without waiting and I hate this without waiting for someone else to show you how to play something as a musician you want to have the skill set in your bones in your body that allows you to listen to something and with reasonable accuracy you know replicate a strumming pattern, we'll call it, that, that captures the tune. What I call captures the vibe of the song. I use that word a lot. It's the best word I can come up with. That's how I like to train strumming skills. I rarely, but I do, I rarely just go and say, okay, for this song, here's a stock pattern, play that. Sure, it gets people going, but it doesn't move them beyond that. In fact, what happens is they get good at that tune, another song comes up, what they've gotten good at is a, is a certain strum pattern that got really deeply wired into their nervous system, and what do you think they do? They use the same strum pattern on that up-and-coming tune, or several up-and-coming tunes. And the point of this is that if you listen to the song, you may determine, as, as the audience, you may determine that what that person's doing in terms of strumming, although you recognize the song, doesn't capture the vibe of it. You'll get much closer to the vibe. You will get much more satisfying strumming results. You will be a more powerful musician if you understand this one idea. Strumming is basically this. I have a wee bit of echo on my amp. Just let me bring that down. <clears throat> now isn't that earth shattering? Wow. In truth it really is because what it's going to allow you to do is learn how to manipulate the up and down hits choosing which parts of this mechanism, I like to call it, the strumming mechanism, which parts of this you're going to hit and which parts you aren't. And these decisions are coming from you in the moment. 
Maybe some of it is pre-rehearsed. That's fine. That's a good starting point. But the, the true joy of being able to sit down and strum through a tune comes from just that very direct connection between the song hitting your ears, going through your brain, and you responding in the moment to playing it based on a mechanism that you've spent a lot of time training. And that basic mechanism, one of a few that I use in my teaching, is just this. And if you can train yourself to keep that underlying mechanism moving like a machine, keep the machine moving, regardless of the way you're hearing the song, you can come up with strum patterns on the fly that allow you to capture the vibe of the tune that make your audience go, oh man, that you played that so well. How did you do that? You know the truth. You trained at it. We're not talking about those of us out there that you know we consider have natural rhythmic skills. They can hear something and make their hand do the vibe of the song, um, but they may still not understand what the underlying architecture is that they're doing. They don't get that. They don't have to, I suppose. They've, they're just wired for it. It's true in every field. There are natural physicians. There are natural teachers. There are natural athletes. There are natural writers. You know, if you have a problem with that awareness, get over it because it's just real. The rest of us basically have to work at it. So do they. We just have to work at it a little more tenaciously, shall we say. Okay, so the question was, which of the two patterns were correct? Well, if you think about what I just mentioned, that the underlying mechanism is this, then what that means is as you're strumming, no matter what the sound is coming out of the guitar, you will visually see in many, many cases that the hand is still just going up and down. <clears throat> That's all it's doing. It is not doing anything else. So I'm going to play the first pattern for you again and watch the behavior of the hand. See if you can see this underlying architecture revealing itself to you visually, even though it's not what you're hearing. Okay, here it is. I'm nervous. One, two, three, four. Did you see it? I hope so. It was there. I'll prove it to you. I'm going to play the pattern once, and then I'm going to move my hand away from the guitar. I'm going to keep the machine going. Watch this. And if you're sitting back going, duh, anybody could figure this out, maybe. But in my experience, in my studio, when I sit with students who are trying to learn to strum, this is an amazing revelation to them because it never occurred to them that what's underneath the sound they hear is a machine that just keeps on moving forward. And you're, all you're doing is manipulating the machine for you know over 90% of things that you're going to play. So here I go. I know I talk a lot. Just bear with me here. One, two, three, four. Okay, I'll do it twice. Now I'm going to pull the hand away. Now look. Da 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 Can you see it? Let's go to the second pattern. One, two, three, four. Without pulling the hand away, I think you would agree that what you visually see is a movement of the hand that's trying to reflect the sound that you hear. This is, this is so big. <clears throat> Makes me just go, you know, it, you're, you're making your hand do what you hear. And in some cases it has its place, but 
For basic awareness, rhythm awareness of strumming behavior, this is not what you want to be doing. You want to cultivate the ability to keep this machine going and then make instant decisions about what parts of this you're going to hit. And, I mean, <clears throat> like all art, there are always exceptions to everything I'm talking about. But we need to start somewhere, and we need to get a good, solid foundation in order to then spread apart from it and tweak, tweak things up a little bit and sort of violate the way, you know, you were trained to do it. That's, that is art. But we, we do need some basic technical stuff under our, under our belts first to get this going. So, um, based on what I just mentioned, the up and down motion of things, I would say to you that the first pattern... is correct at many or on many levels. Number one, because you get the hand moving in a continuous steady motion, there's, there's no feeling neurologically, so to speak, of jerkiness in the hand. It, it, it's like a fluid. <laughs> and when the fluid is moving freely, what comes out in terms of sound in this case happens more naturally. <clears throat> in the second example, that little moment where the hand stalled, watch. Right here, and then I continue on with it. If in your mind you were thinking, hit, 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 stop, hit, 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 hit stop, hit, that's very confusing for the brain and the nervous system to process. That's why you don't tend to see it when people are strumming. Look at the strumming of Dave Matthews. Very accomplished rhythm guitarist, obviously singer as well. You will see, if you study that hand when he's doing basic uh, backup, rhythmic backup to songs, there's the hand just doing this the whole time. <clears throat> now, if it's, if it's correct for Dave Matthews, I have to say it's got to be correct for you guys too. There's no way around this. So... Um, the key feature then is to, and that's where basically the second video is focusing on, the key feature now is to get you aware of the fact that the hand is just going up and down. And because of it, in order to help you know when and where to miss strings during the movement of this machine, uh, we need names for these movements. <clears throat> This is not earth-shattering stuff, folks. This is basic musical awareness 101. Check it out. Musicians think of, break, of the movements or the sounds they make in terms of a certain language, like this. One, two, three, four. One and two and three and four and 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 one. Often, beginning players think, oh, I hit one, two, three, four. I hit the guitar four times, one, two, three, four, and then I stall for like one and a half seconds, <laughs> one, two, three, four, and then I continue on and, and do something. That isn't the way it works. There is a language to rhythm, there's a structure to it that is as predictable and clean as graph paper, plotting graphs. There's, there's really no mystery to it. It's just that a lot of people don't get exposed to it, and in my studio, I put a lot of emphasis on it right from day one. The moment you start to play, you're thinking this way. Because the longer you think about it and the sooner you start thinking about it, that rhythm awareness gets in your body too, which is where we want it to go. We don't want it just here. It's got to be everywhere, and it, it kind of comes out of the guitar this way. So if you look up, I think it'll be up here. If you look up at that corner, you'll see I've been uh, flashing up arrows, which a lot of guitar teachers use to demonstrate the motion of playing. But what I'm doing with the arrows is indicating the names of certain events and by you know keeping certain of those arrows hollow, there's no color in them, that's a visual indication to you, the student, that that's where you still move the, the hand in the direction of the arrow, but you consciously miss 
the strings. You don't hit the strings. This is excellent training to help you get this hand moving constantly regardless of what you're hearing. Cool? So I think what I'm going to do then is um, uh, leave you with another question. And that is, given the strum pattern that you now hear and we know is correct, or I'm, I'm saying it's correct, and you can see it, I guess it's over on that side, I don't know where it is, it's somewhere up here, I can never get it straight. When you see it visually, I want you to be able to get into the habit of saying verbally what it is you're physically doing. Play, 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 and then you miss, and then you hit, and then you... I want you to be able to describe that verbally very well. So I'm going to have the pattern up there. You can watch it while I'm playing, and, um, and, and see if in your mind, as you're going one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and... Which in itself takes some training to do. It's kind of an awkward thing to think about. I want you to be able to say what parts of that are you hitting strings on and what parts of that are you missing them. And when you're missing them, I still want your hand moving in that direction. Eventually what happens as you develop a deep comfort with this stuff, you, you don't have to swing the hand consciously and miss things. You, you begin to sense it, be aware of it in your mind, in your body, and, and then you start to see people's hands kind of hang for a little bit. For a bit, but they're still feeling it. They know where they are. They understand the logic of it all. They've, they've done all this training. Okay, enough talk. So, until I see you in the third and final installment of this little mini-series, uh, I want you to be thinking about, as I play this pattern, being able to verbalize when you're hitting the strings and when you aren't. <clears throat> I'm going to play the pattern, I'll have the arrows up again, all identified, and I'll leave it to you to figure this out. One, two, three, four. I'm going to play the second pattern, and I want you to be able to say to me, given, again, the arrows, wherever they are up here, given the arrows, I want you to tell me why I'm saying the second pattern is not correct. One, two, three, four. In the third installment, I'm going to present probably one of the most important features you need to be able to train in order that this procedure uh, gives you the greatest results quickly. Until then, thanks for listening again. Steve Dempster, Dempster Guitar Studio. Uh, play it right. Play for life, folks. Talk to you soon. Bye.